Hello everybody, in this video series I'm going to be showing you how I made this Bruno workbench. Hello everyone and welcome to episode 4 of the Rubo series. This episode, a bit of a long one, um, I have actually split it in two to make it a bit more manageable so you can stand up, have a walk around between episodes, should you so wish. Um, in this one, focusing on mortising and tenoning the frame together, getting the draw balls in place and then in the next one I'll be focusing on the tongue and grooves. So because the design of this workbench is a split top, I need a support under the tabletop. If it's just a solid top all the way through, that solid top bridges the gap between the front and the back leg and you don't need any sort of support underneath. Being a split top, the front and back aren't actually joined, therefore it's going to start sagging over time. You need a support under it to keep it all level and flat and everything, so that's what I'm making here. I wanted to make these the same width as the legs, so about 120 millimeters, and still be quite thick in height as well to support the weight of the top. So to do that, got two of the sort of lighter bits of wood that I wasn't gonna use for the top, stuck them together using dominoes to locate it, and then shoved them through the sander to get them to the exact same thickness as the legs. Anyone noticing that book matched end grain there? No? Just me? So having the supports the same width as the legs not only serves a aesthetic purpose but it also means that I can use both sides to reference the domino bed on. If that stretcher is a little bit thinner or a little bit wider than the leg and then you reference off one side and basically it won't line up. They need to be exactly the same size if you're going to reference off both sides. Hard to explain, you have to sort of use a domino to understand it or other locational device. But basically it gives me four evenly spaced domino holes to support that stretcher effectively. So there you can see the four corresponding holes in the back of the leg. And with those all cut I could then mark out the location for the mortises at the bottom of the legs to support the stretchers. Just measured down from the shoulder of the tenon and then marked off where it needed to start, where it needed to end, squared that across and then that gave me the boundaries to start cutting my mortises. To save me the faff of marking down from the shoulders on each individual leg, just use that first one as the template for the rest of them. Little note here, if you're going to use one for the template, always use the first one that you mark off. If you mark the first one to the second one, then the second one to the third one, and so on, your discrepancies start adding up and then things will become severely misaligned. So always use the first one to template, or to template? To use as a template for the rest of them. Now this project also gave me the excuse to go out and buy a mortise gauge which was great because I've always wanted one and never had the excuse to do it. So now I have one which is great. Use that to mark the sides of the mortise walls and then mark the waist. And before I committed to anything, get all of the legs stood up on end in their corresponding locations or their proper locations and double check that I've marked the mortises in the correct face or on the correct face. Last thing I want to be doing is accidentally cutting a mortise on one of the faces and have to plug it later with some major bodge job. But it was all good. As you can see here, all the mortises are on the inside face facing one another, which is what we want. 
Now the tenon on the front left leg where the vice hardware is, is a little bit different because it kind of has to wrap around the bench crafted crisscross hardware that's going to be recessed into the front of the leg. So this is like a stepped mortise which you'll see later on, but this takes three marking gauges to mark out. So this was the hardest part of the entire project, getting this three quarter inch mortising bit to cut into ash. Absolutely dreadful task and it was boiling that day. Um, as you can see here, it starts smoking a little bit. The bit wasn't the sharpest thing in the world and I know it's easy to say you should always work with a sharp bit, your bit should never be blunt, but this bit was part of the college's inventory and Obviously in furniture making, three quarter inch bits are seldom used. You very rarely have a need for them. So it's not something on the top of their list to purchase a new one or keep maintained because it's just it's just sat there 90% of the time. It's only when someone like me comes along wanting to make a Rubo workbench that it actually gets used. But I got it to work. Our machine's heavy duty enough to withstand all that pressure pushing down. So I use that to its full advantage, let's say. So here's the stepped mortise. Now this six millimeter one went right down to the full depth, the same depth as all the other mortises. And then I used the 19 millimeter one again to cut the little stub tenon on the inside of that. This just adds a little bit more beef to the front and back width of the tenon. So at this point there's still a little bit of cleanup to do. As you can see the mortise doesn't quite reach that pencil line and at the bottom there still some round holes that the corners need to be cleared up. So I know it's absolute blasphemy but I didn't have a mortising chisel that was wide enough so I used my bevel edged ones, my Nielsen. I know it's, it's disgraceful, it's a horrible thing to do, I'm sorry. But it worked fine, I had a three quarter inch one that matched the width of the mortise so so it was an opportunity too good to miss, let's put it that way. Okay, so those of you who follow me on Instagram would have seen this. Test fitting the legs into the top that I made in the previous video. My good Jesus Christ God was it a tight fit. Uh, <laughs> basically, so you can get a perspective of how tight this is, um, firstly, I had to bottom them out with clamps, but listen to the sound it makes as I'm pressing them in. So you might be wondering at this point why I'm so stupid to risk getting those legs stuck in the top. And the reason is so I could precisely mark the shoulder lines on the stretchers without having to rely on the drawing. By this point, after creating the wedged mortises and the top of the workbench, it may differ ever so slightly from the drawing. So doing it this way allows me to get everything precise and mark off the actual piece as opposed to the drawing. It also gives me an opportunity to properly orientate the grain to look the best once the workbench is complete. You probably uh, spotted it before, but in the completed workbench, if you look at the front stretcher, you'll see that I've perfectly centered the sort of circular grain in the center of that stretcher. And then this was the other fun part, getting the bastards out. <laughs> um, so yeah, to do this basically just reverse the clamping action. I will leave you with the satisfying creaking sounds of these coming out because it's just amazing.
And with the long stretches all shoulder lined up, great description there Matt. The shorter stretches that run front to back could also be marked up using the workbench top support that I created earlier on in the video. And with the marking gauges not moved at all since I marked out the mortises, I could mark that straight onto the end grain of the tenon. So this is the sort of weird one that wraps around the crisscross hardware, hence why I'm using the three gauges. And then use the mortise gauge for the other ones. And then to cut the tenons to their sort of rough finished state, I used the bandsaw. To start with I use the router plane to clean up these tenons which works really great for this because you can reference off that outer face and keep the tenon parallel without accidentally putting a skew on it but in the end the gap was too big to properly support the router plane so I moved on to a shoulder plane. And then the only thing left to do at this point was to cut the remaining cheeks off the tenon and create a shoulder on all four faces. So when dry fitting that special tenon, I realized I made a little bit of a silly. And this was because, as you can see here, I marked the face edge on the wrong edge of the component. What this did was relocate the beef of that component where I was supposed to shape the sliding dead man slightly bit on the underside of the stretcher rather than the top where it needed to be because the whole component had been flipped over. So, it was a bit of a nightmare, but what I had to do was sort of remachine that top face, cut off the bottom, and then here I'm sticking the bottom back on the top where it should be. And that is where the bulk of the material should have been, as opposed to underneath. And to cut the final shoulder lines on the tenons, could have done it by hand, but again, I just wanted to try it out on the table saw, save me a bit of time as well. To do that, simply set up the fence to butt up against the edge of the tenon, adjusted it, ever so slightly in small increments at a time until I started hitting that knife line and then committed to it without moving that fence. And to save standing that component up on ends to cut that remaining part of the bottom of the tenon, just use the little Japanese saw that I've got and then clean it up to the knife line using a chisel. Okay, now we're on to draw boring. Now, Draw boring, I'll go over it quickly. Essentially what it is, is you're driving a dowel through the side of the mortise and through the tenon to lock it all in place. Obviously this gives it a lot of strength, but what you can do to take it further is actually offset those holes in such a way that it pulls the tenon even more into the face of the leg. So what I'm doing here is marking 30 millimeters in from where those joints are meant to meet. And then on the tenon, I'm marking about 28 in from where the joints are going to meet. And that is how everything will be locked in place. 
This was actually a technique done in, uh, I'll just say history, but basically before you could clamp things properly over long widths, if you use draw balls like this, or if you've got an awkward mortise and tenons clamp up, this is a great way of doing it. Put yourself an offset in there and it yanks that tenon into the mortise and it makes it absolutely rock solid. So there, I was just setting up a depth stop for the drill bit to make sure I didn't go too far. I don't think there's any particular rules for how deep you should drill. As long as it goes through both faces of the mortise and the tenon, you should be absolutely fine. Then for the very final fitting of the tenons, for those of them that hadn't quite bottomed out yet, if you scribble all over them first with paper, shove them in and they start getting stuck. Once you take that out, you'll see all of the parts of the pencil line that are smudged there and then you know exactly where to remove the material from. So once that was all complete, got the more sizzle bottomed out and then I could start laying out for the grooves for the tongue and grooves to go in. But that'll be detailed in the next video because this one took absolutely ages to get a lot of ground covered. Um, so yeah, I will see you then.